Hey guys, Alice here with Carbide3D. I was looking for a project to test some more advanced CNC techniques, so when my friend Winston reached out to me and said, Hey Alice, you want to design a CNC machine foam dart launching Nerf compatible toy blaster? I said obviously and opened up Photoshop and we started brainstorming together. I started with a few basic sketches of what we had in mind, and then refined it a little once we had the silhouette down. From there, I brought it into Fusion 360 as a canvas. I wanted to make this as accessible as possible no matter where you are in the world, so I did my best to make all of the hardware parametric. This means that you can just open up the Parameters tab and change all of the dimensions to suit your hardware. The most important thing for you to customize is the spring parameters. These are the inner diameter of the spring and the length that you want the spring to be when compressed. You can determine the length of the compressed spring by measuring the diameter of the wire in your spring and multiplying that by the number of coils you intend to use. I would also add a few millimeters to be sure that you're not over compressing the spring. And if you want lighter and faster shots, I would add a few centimeters so that you're not at full compression. For machining, I decided to start with the grips. I knew the grips were going to be a two-sided operation, so I needed some way of indexing them after flipping them. I decided to use the holes that would later be used for brass pins on the final product. I would start by machining them undersized and running them all the way through and into the wasteboard. After planing down my walnut, I stuck it down to the wasteboard using double-sided tape zeroed off the top of the workpiece, and then did a facing pass. From there, I re-zeroed off the top of the workpiece. This, of course, meant that subsequent cuts were being cut way too low. Unfortunately, that made the whole piece unsalvageable. So after going out and picking up more walnut and planning it all over again, I decided to move my zero point down to the wasteboard rather than the top of the stock. This meant that I had a consistent height for setting the Z offset of my tools. It was an obvious mistake, but it was a good lesson to learn. The inside of the grips is actually really simple. There aren't really that many features, so you're really just defining the general shape. I made sure to leave both sections of each grip connected so that it would be symmetrical when you flipped it. On the second side, most of the work is done by an adaptive toolpath. It really roughly removes most of the material you're trying to get rid of, while leaving enough material left over that you can bring it to final dimension with a much nicer toolpath. For that much nicer toolpath, I decided to use a scallop with a quarter inch ball end mill. With a 0.2 millimeter step over, it left a surface finish that was just nice enough that it was pretty easy to sand it smooth. For the plastic, I decided to use UHMW for how wear resistant it is. With hindsight, I don't really think this was the best choice. It's extremely flexible and gummy, so it's prone to warping and running away from the tool when you're trying to cut it. It's absolutely doable, but for our purposes, it's probably more work than it's worth. With the benefit of hindsight, I probably would have used something like acetal. It's also very wear resistant, but it's much more rigid and easier to machine. Since the material was so warped, I had to face it from both sides in order to just get a flat surface to clamp it down with. I really avoided just trying to clamp it flat, with the idea being that once you let off that clamping pressure, your final part would warp. It might have helped a bit, but the part was still warped, so I'm not really sure. I decided to use the same technique that I used on the grips to flip the UHMW as well. That part went off without a hitch, however, when I flipped it over, the whole thing got caught on the cutter and it ripped the piston arm loose. This meant that I had to start the whole process over again. 
I was, however, able to salvage a few of the parts from the operation so that I would have spares for later. Attempt number two went fairly uneventfully. The machining for the plastic was made up entirely of really simple tool paths just put together. Mostly boring and circular operations with a couple pockets in there. There were also a few scallop tool paths in there, just to clean up the surface finish on the rear part of the barrel assembly, which really had no business being as pretty as it was. If you have any plans to machine UHMW or any soft plastic really, I would highly recommend cutting conventional. The material tends to fold out of the way and leave little stringy bits on climb cuts. Next I moved on to the two metal parts, which went really easily. I designed them to basically just be profile cuts, so it would be relatively simple to manufacture. I made sure to run my tool paths from the inside out just to make sure that the part stayed attached to the stock for as long as possible. Deciding how to approach the piston body was a much more complicated endeavor. You have to be able to machine three sides all exactly 90 degrees from each other. And it has to be pretty precise as well. What I ended up doing was manufacturing a pair of square clamps with a hole through the middle that was perfectly sized to fit the tube. This meant that I could drop these clamps down into a pair of carbide 3D mini vices. That allowed me to index and clamp all four sides precisely. I also dropped in some small squares of rubber grip mat between the polycarbonate tube and the clamp just to be sure that the tube didn't rotate while it was being machined. I would however recommend that you clamp down very tightly. You can probably see that my first attempt did not go very well. Unfortunately, the cutter grabbed the workpiece and pulled it up out of the vices. Since the workpiece is up so high, I had to lift the router inside of its clamp in order to clear the brackets that I made to hold the tube. The second attempt went relatively smoothly, however there was a bit of friction on the shank of the end mill as it got near the bottom of the cut. It's manageable, but it's just something you have to watch out for. Next, we have to prepare all of our parts for assembly. Cut your pins to length, leaving them just a little oversized so you can file them down later. Install them in one side, slightly proud of the surface, and then glue and clamp each half of the two grips together. File the pins flush with the grips and then sand them up to 800 grit to leave a nice brushed finish on the pins and prep the wood for finishing. I used about five thin coats of polyurethane on mine for a bit of protection and to leave a nice smooth finish.
You'll need to cut whatever you're using for barrel material to length. I'm using 17 30 seconds brass tube. I'd recommend filing the front surface of the trigger smooth so that it doesn't dig into your finger. If you want a really professional finish, I highly recommend sanding all of your brass parts up to at least 800 grit for a nice brushed finish. It's usually the little things like breaking over the edges with a deeper ring tool that ends up making your part look really premium and professional. From there, I locked that really nice surface finish in with a coating of polyurethane to prevent it from tarnishing. Once all of your parts have cured, it's finally time to assemble the whole thing. Start by inserting the barrels into the rear spacer with a healthy bead of glue to make a nice airtight seal. It's important to do your best to make sure the barrels stay straight in this step. From there, you can glue on the front spacer as well. Install the O-ring and the washer in the rear, and then you can slide it into the front of the barrel. The catch mechanism is pretty straightforward. It just needs a couple of springs, and then you sandwich the whole thing together. We bored the holes for the screws earlier, so we should just need to thread them in. Insert the piston arm, drop on the spring, and screw on the piston head sandwich. Insert the whole assembly into the piston body and align the catch with the hole on the bottom. Drill a few millimeters into the catch through the holes in the body and insert the screws. Attach a small spring to the trigger and install it in the grip with a short pin to act as a pivot. Now we can glue the rear grip onto the piston body. Make sure the trigger engages the catch as you lower it down to maintain alignment. You only get one shot at this. Lay the grip flat on the table with the piston body hanging off the edge. Apply a bit of glue to the foregrip and slide it up against the piston body to ensure both grips are clocked properly. And that's it. Once your glue is cured, it's done. All the files to build this project yourself are up right now on Cut Rocket. If you want to use my cam, there's links to all the files you'll need in the notes of the project. I also tried my best to make this a platform, something that myself and others could build on. Currently, the biggest limitation for its power is the length of the barrels. There's just not enough time for the darts to get up to velocity before they leave the barrel, so you end up wasting a lot of pressure. It's a trade-off I made to make it a little easier to load. But if you want to try to get every ounce of power you can out of this thing, 
I made the barrels modular so you can design your own and swap them out however you want. There is so much potential in this little thing, but the most important thing is that you're just having fun with it. Thank you everyone for watching. If you want more machining content and you want to know what happened to that piece missing from my brass stock, we'll leave you with a link to that video.